Welcome to Ask the Librarians Comics and Manga 101, presented by Library Pass and Comics Plus. My name is Gila Charles Gonzalez. I'm the Chief Content Officer for Library Pass and the moderator for today's session. I'm excited to be joined by an esteemed panel of librarians who will be sharing their expertise and insights with us today. Moni Barrett is a 16-year public librarian and is currently the Director of Collection Development and Publisher Relations at Library Pass. As co-founder of the nonprofit Creators Assemble, San Diego State University lecturer, 2023 Eisner Awards judge, and past president of the ALA's Graphic Novel and Comics Roundtable, she is dedicated to promoting learning through the use of comics and popular culture. Stella Bromley is a National Board Certified Teacher Librarian with experience at all levels of K-12 education and is currently an Engagement Specialist at Library Pass, where she collaborates with school librarians and district leaders across the U.S. to engage and inspire school communities to integrate Comics Plus with library programming and classroom library instruction. She is an active member of the Texas Library Association, the American Association of School Librarians, and the American Library Association. Ashley Hawkins' expertise in collection development and student-centered librarianship finds her currently working as a school librarian in Brooklyn and an adjunct professor for Queens College GSLIS. She is also a reviewer for Booklist, a blogger for Knowledge Quest, has her own blog, Manga Librarian, and is in the process of working on a book in collaboration with Julie Stivers, Sarah Smith, Emily Radica, and Sybil Moana Ture on the use of manga in school libraries. Today's webinar is presented by Library Pass. We curate high interest immersive digital content that helps libraries and schools expand their reach and engagement without breaking their materials budget. Our Comics Plus platform offers unlimited simultaneous access to thousands of digital comics, graphic novels, and manga in collections curated for elementary, middle school, and high school readers. We also offer a complete collection, including thousands of additional titles for older readers for uh, to public and academic libraries. Learn more and sign up for a free demo account at comicsplusapp.com. And now, enjoy today's session. All right, housekeeping over. Uh, I'm really excited about today's webinar. This uh, combines two of my favorite things talking about comics and manga and talking to librarians and letting them share their expertise about stuff because uh, the world doesn't listen to librarians enough, I think. And that's uh, not just saying that because the audience that uh, we're all in right now. So we're gonna cover uh, a number of things. Like I said in the intro, we got a lot of questions in advance that I think cover some very frequently asked questions and some more interesting ones that don't pop up often enough. And we're gonna try and balance them all. I've given brief intros for each of you, so I don't want to dwell on that, but I do before we jump into the conversation. I'd like to have each of you kind of give a notable comics or manga related note about yourself beyond your bios, uh, just to set the table for our conversation today. So starting with Moni. Ooh, notable. Uh, one of my only tattoos is a quote from one of my favorite comic books, which is March by the late Congressman John Lewis. I have good trouble tattooed on me. So that's that's my comics notable. That is notable. Mm -hmm. All right. Stella? I am a Japan Fulbright Memorial Fund participant. I wanted to learn more about Japanese manga back in 2006. And so I wrote an essay and was allowed, was invited to travel with 60, no, 120 other educators across the country. And we traveled Japan for th 21 days, learning about the Japanese culture, about manga and everything else. Wow, that is also very notable. And Ashley? Um, so I actually am, um particularly interested in cat manga and I have an entire collection of neko manga um that is just my thing I was actually just in Japan and brought back a suitcase full of just cat manga so awesome. and picture books so <laughs> great so not only do we have uh, very experienced credential librarians, but we also have some deep comic expertise. I'm just here to moderate, but I also, my own background, grew up reading comics, love comics, wrote about comics on fan sites for years. And so this job was kind of the golden opportunity to combine a love of comics and a love of libraries together. And so 
Let's start with arguably the most frequently asked question and maybe sometimes not asked often enough. Uh, one of my biggest pet peeves is when people call comics a genre. So let's get into definitions. Um, first, when we talk comics and manga, uh, and we'll start with Moni, let's define the medium overall. What? How do you define comics and manga broadly? So broadly, comics is sequential art, and graphic novels are a long form work of of graphic arts, uh, sequential art. However, like what is long form? These are all things that are debatable. Uh, speaking for myself, not for my colleagues here on this panel, but I know a lot of other folks in comics librarianship don't really love the term graphic novel as it's too often used either to make the format sound more legitimate or like legitimize it in a way that it doesn't need or more literary. It also can confuse folks, especially in the day and age where we're seeing bans and challenges to comics, uh, because they think that graphic might inherently mean that all of it is mature. Um, so I use the term when I'm generally referring to longer form comics, like single issues that are collected into a full volume. Uh, that's that's my definition broadly of graphic novels. Yeah, and that, that is a really good note. Um... In my mind, graphic novels were an industry term created by people who were embarrassed about comics, but also recognized there was money to be made there. Um, so the other thing about comics is beyond the traditional print formats, we have web comics, we have webtoons, we have comic strips, you know, that predate comic books. Um, Ashley, let's get into manga a little bit. So we got a lot of questions about manga. So let's start with the basics and then drift into nuances like the manga specific subcategories and the differences between say manga, manhwa, webtoons. Okay, so manga is simply the Japanese word for comics. So actually in Japan, if you ask for manga, you could get Spider-Man. Um, <laughs> That it, but when we talk about it as a loan word, we are talking about Japanese comics. Um, so we are talking about this. Um, so manga is the word that we in the West use for Japanese comics. Um, and that's the simplest way to put it. Um, when we're talking about manga versus anime, um, Hi, kimchi. Um, so manga, Japanese word for comics. Anime is the Japanese word for animation. Um, similarly, um, in Japan, if you say anime, it's anything that's animated. Um, but we are talking specifically in the West. When we say anime, we are talking about animation that is made in Japan. Um, and actually now it's starting to connotate a particular style because, um, for example, people will say that Avatar The Last Airbender is anime style, um, even though it is primarily um, animated by a South Korean um, animator team, animation team. Um, and also the terms can be used interchangeably for style. So you can say that somebody is an anime style illustrator um, and this animator has long been inspired by manga um, because we're talking more about style and it, it can be kind of fluid. Um, so, but when we're talking about specifically the formats, the formats are manga is still anime moves. Um, and then when we get into manhwa um, and webtoons, um, manhwa is the Korean word for comics. Um, so, and we want to be very clear about that because um, there are some, we, we don't want to call manhwa or Korean webtoons um, manga um, for a lot of reasons. Um, especially because of the kind of tensions that exist between South Korean and Japanese um, identities. Um, and we, this is kind of like a chicken and egg kind of thing. Um, webtoons are comics that exist on a web-based platform. Manhwa 
can be webtoons, but not all webtoons are manhwa. Um, so they get easily conflated because many manhwa are webtoons because quite honestly, um, where does Samsung originate? In South Korea. They are very prolific smartphone users and actually so are Japanese readers, but especially Koreans are huge, huge smartphone readers. They read novels on the web. They read, um, they read a lot on their phones. Um, and we kind of have conflated it also because there's a Korean based platform called Webtoon, which also is used here. And it all just kind of like mingles together. So we sort of start to mix the two terms together. Um, but not every manhwa is a webtoon. Um, so some manhwa is illustrated traditionally using just a normal ink pen um, done on paper. It is not done digitally um, and is made for made in traditional formats. Um, the work of Kum Suk Gundry Kim um, is like a good example of that. Um, she has publications through Drawn and Quarterly that are never produced as webtoons and they are meant to be printed and read as print books. They can be read in a digital interface just like any print book can be, but they are not distributed on these web platforms like webtoon. Cool. So short answer, Comics are legion. They are mm -hmm. the you know comics in my mind is the umbrella. Manga is comics in Japan. We on Comics Plus do conflate manga with Western manga, like manga inspired manga adjacent content. That's a metadata challenge more than a us being rude challenge. Um, but it's something we are working towards. But it is an important distinction as we've kind of broken down. Um, so let's move on because we could just talk about that forever, but I think we covered all the basics there. Let's talk a little bit about manga specifically because we got a lot of questions. I feel like in the US, most librarians in particular are relatively comfortable with comics and graphic novels. Manga for a lot of them is a relatively new um, category for them. And it's the most in demand in a lot of places right now. So let's talk a little bit about we're going to drift into age appropriateness after this. One of the biggest questions that always comes up related to manga is about age appropriateness. And how do you gauge publisher age ratings, which generally speaking in the comics industry are highly unreliable, uh, but particularly for manga with cultural differences. So Ashley, if you can talk a little bit about the manga kind of subcategory age breakdowns and then... How does that map to U.S. in particular sensibilities, but also recognizing we do have a number of Australia, New Zealand, if not attending live, definitely planning to watch. So also want to be cognizant of some regional conversation. OK, so here's the thing. Um, when we're talking about like age relevance, age appropriateness and everything when it relates to manga, one thing you need to realize is that the so. If I show you a volume of manga in Japan, that's why I actually have these here, it does not have what we have here. It does not have the age ratings. That is specifically done for people in English-speaking Western countries. Um, in Australia, they are also, as I understand it, um, very cognizant about maintaining um, a balance about what can be read by who. Um, but, um, and actually, the French also do not do age rating. So this is cat plus gamer in French. Um, so not everybody does it. But if I pull up, here we go. Um, this is, oh my gosh, and this isn't, oh, there it is. It's very tiny. So this is a manga that has the T plus. So publishers take it very seriously, actually. And they're actually taking it more seriously now than they were before. Um, so I know publishers 
in Japan and in the US. Um, in Japan, it's just kind of like, who are we marketing to? Um, they don't really worry about like, is it going to get censored in schools or is it going to get censored in libraries? Because quite honestly, it's not really going to. And libraries are not really their main concern. Um, there are libraries that exist and it just, it just doesn't, the issues don't really exist for a librarian, particularly a school librarian um, in Japan. Um, school libraries look very different in Japan than they do um, in the West. Um, and so they don't worry so much about that. It's just about who's it marketed to, who are we trying to sell this to? It's more about that. But here they are more cognizant. Like we are trying to let people know kind of what's inside of here because there are cultural differences. So there are cultural differences about um, nudity. There are cultural differences about like bathing practices, cultural differences about just all sorts of things um, because we're just two different cultures. So when we bring something from Japan and bring it to the West, there needs to be some kind of explanation. Um, I will say there are like levels of censorship within like manga magazines. Certain magazines cannot show like smoking or drinking um, if they are marketed to a particular age group. So they have to say things like um, they're actually drinking juice or whatever. Um, there's actually a joke about it in Gekkan Sh uh Monthly girls Nozaki Kun, um, when he's trying to, you know, navigate the rules that he has as a manga creator to um, get around creating for girls magazine as opposed to an older audience. Um, but it, I do know that at Viz and Kadansha and all of them, when they say it's older teen, they mean it's older teen. Um, and usually it, all it takes is for it to be teen, it's one drink, one alcoholic drink, one cigarette, um, one panty shot, something. Um, and it can be a very quick turn. And sometimes you'll read something and be like, why is this teen? Why isn't this for a younger audience? Well, it's usually because either you are looking at the text and seeing, um, okay, there's like one cigarette, like somebody smokes a cigarette and it could be just a throwaway like character who is not that big a deal or somebody's just drinking, whatever. So these are things to keep in mind for collection development purposes um, because it's going to vary depending on your collection development policy. Um, but there's also something else to keep in mind. Um, we get manga um, much, not as much later as we used to, but we get it later um, into its publication run than you get it in Japan. Um, in Japan, you tend to get the first volume um, fairly quickly after the issues have come out. We tend to get them a little bit more distant. Um, usually there are multiple volumes out in Japan because they've kind of looked and seen, oh, this is more popular in Japan. So they push it out and they say, okay. And you might say, why is my, my hero academia like this high up? Well, because they know that in like five, six, seven volumes, the ante is going to be upped <laughs> and the... The creator is going to be like, oh, I need to move up with my audience who is getting older, who started as 12 year olds and now are 15 year olds and want to see a little bit more gore, want to see mm, the, the characters are getting older and they're aging up with the audience and they're maybe getting more interested in girls than they were at the beginning of the story. Like things shift. So if it doesn't seem like it's a teen series in volume one. They're kind of giving you a hint for down the road. So honestly, I would trust them, but you also need to look at your collection development policy.
So let's uh, let's segue a little into the broader age appropriate conversation. And you know, uh, I want to start with Stella. So we've got Ashley in Brooklyn with a you know deep connection to manga. Like you read manga in Japanese, right? Yeah. So you're you're reading it long before and legally because you're a librarian, not uh, like uh, fan relations like some other people. Stella's in Austin, Texas, um, and we've got a couple of questions that. Uh, broadly range about cultural differences. So there's Japanese and American cultural differences. There's Australian, New Zealand, American. But in America, there are cultural differences. San Diego, New Jersey, Texas, New York. Right there, there's a huge gap in differences. So Stella, from a school perspective, talk a little bit about age appropriateness for comics in general and that particular challenge of long-running comics or manga where stories age up. How, how how do you handle that? And where have you run into situations like that? Um, so one of the things when I was purchasing for an individual library, I would always kind of start at the keep it the first few of the series and really make sure that my students were going to move forward with that character, because sometimes they get bored and they move on because of I know the changes that grow, which is very smart for an author or a creator to age up. I mean, goosebumps, gosh, I wish he would have aged up because I couldn't get ninth graders <laughs> to stop reading goosebumps. But knowing that that's available, knowing that that when I would go to the bookstore, because that's how I purchased a lot of mine is going directly to the bookstore and having to look through the whole series before making that decision. So, you know, there are different rules and laws coming in place and we have to always keep those in mind and make sure that the whole series is going to be appropriate for the group. Moni, from a public library perspective, what, what are the unique challenges there where in theory, the collection's there for everyone, you may have a children's collection. How, how do you manage that? Or, or did you run into scenarios where a series got moved from children to say teen or to the main collection because of either actual age changes in the storytelling or community changes in what might be considered appropriate. So it didn't happen very often, but I do want to kind of bring it back for all types of libraries, for manga and for comics too, is, um, you know, using the publisher recommendation as a starting or a jumping off point. And then as Ashley mentioned, how a series will age up. So if you see a hint of that in the first one, maybe, you know, skim through the first one and the latest one, wherever that's at, uh, and then kind of go at the highest point. Um, you know, public libraries benefit, we get a lot of, you know, our copy cataloging from other sources, but you do need to know your community. And that's the same as with any collection, uh, as Stella mentioned, laws and things coming to, into effect. I have worked in several libraries in the Southern California area. And one, I couldn't do like Harry Potter or like witchcraft type of stuff, uh, which was not a problem in any of the San Diego area uh, libraries. So it, it's also just keeping abreast of like what your community finds acceptable. And that goes with like, like Ashley said, your collection development policy um, and, and your peers and what your feedback you're getting from, you know, your patrons, whether they be students or, you know, the general public. Cool. So the... Let's go back to manga for a second, because there were a couple of age appropriate related questions that came up there. Um, so, Ashley, let's talk about fan service and let's get more specifically into cultural differences, sexuality versus, say, violence. We love violence mm -hmm. here. We're a little squeamish about sexuality here being yes. in the U.S. <laughs> so fan service or fan service. Um, uh, it's also known in anime as a service cut or a service cut book, um, is material in a work of fiction. And we're talking about manga um, or in a fictional series that's intentionally added to please the audience. It's service to the fans. Um, <clears throat> we associate it with racy or titillating content, but it's actually not limited to that. Um, it can't, it, what I'm going to focus on is that, but when we talk about fan service, quite honestly, when I'm watching a mecha anime and there are like those really complex sequences where you can see all the like 
the the gears turning and everything um if i'm somebody who's like really into that and i like love seeing like animation of like really intricate mechanisms that's actually fan service it's giving the fan what i i want as like somebody who really likes mecha but we're gonna talk about the racier titillating content um the term originated in japan but it's actually kind of moved out. So it's actually a loan word from English that was brought into Japanese to talk about something that happens in anime and then moved back out to the West. Um, so the thing is, um, Japan actually is a fairly conservative country. Um, if you go to Japan, um, I am wearing... A completely Japanese outfit right now. Um, I would never wear, if I were in Japan, I would never wear this dress without the shirt underneath it. Um, it's just, it's actually very conservative. So the art is actually exploring sides of sexuality um, that you wouldn't actually see in real life. It's very titillating as almost like an explosion outward of things that you don't see in real life um and there's like all sorts of scholarship and things that delve into this um there's a really great book uh by Patrick Galbraith called Moe Manifesto that kind of goes into this um this is something that we could have a whole webinar in of itself um why um there's why Japanese um media does this because quite honestly you would never see the kind of expression that you see in anime and manga and video games um in anything live action um the joke is if you see like a j drama um you may never even see the two characters kiss um so there are some like big disparities in terms of like what gets expressed um but also it's very common to bathe together there's a different bathing culture and there are certain places where you do see um those expressions of bodies and that would be like at the beach so a common fan service thing is to have all of your characters go to the beach <laughs> and have a beach episode and all the girls get out into their bikinis and that is very fan servicey because it's a culturally acceptable reason to be scantily clad because you're going swimming because Japan is actually a very hot country in the summer. Um, so the thing is when we're talking about like, okay, there's questionable content in some manga. I do want to like be very clear. Not every manga has right. questionable content. I read a lot of manga that has nothing <laughs> sexual or anything there are there is so much as much manga as 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 many types of books as there are there is manga manga is just a format the thing is what's most popular tends to be stuff that does include fan service because um unfortunately male gazy stuff tends to get brought over really heavily and for some reason it tends to be what's pushed really into your face but there are really great titles that have none of that. Um, and that doesn't mean also that titles that have fan service necessarily need to be thrown out. They do have great things in them and great lessons that we can access with our students. Um, what you have to do is sit down as the public or the school librarian. And usually it's the school librarian who has to make these choices, right? But particularly right now with laws and things that are going on. Um, and say, okay, what is the fan service? What is it doing as a text? Like, what is the text's purpose, right? Um, so is it a one-page thing? Um, is it important? Um, is it whole book's worth? Um, and also, is it so explicit or so off the cuff that it maybe makes me say, hmm, maybe I need to select something else. Um, or 
Is it worth defending the whole of the content by saying, listen, this is one frame. This is one little, this is one little snapshot, snapshot out of an entire thing. Um, you have to look at the text as a whole, because if we only take little pieces of anything and take them out of context, then we're throwing the baby out with the bathwater. Um, so you have to really look at everything. Um, this isn't an easy thing to do as a collection developer, um, especially in the world we live in right now. Um, so you have to kind of sit down and be like, am I willing to, is this a text I'm willing to fight for? If the page gets opened up to and scandalizes somebody, is it actually gonna scandalize anybody? Um, what's the context? Is this an arc I can skip? So some shonen battle manga, you can actually skip arcs and it won't make any difference. Um, they run for so long. And honestly, kids will just think that you lost it because <laughs> manga goes missing all the time. You can kind of finagle and play and think about things. Maybe some things you have physically and you have other things digitally so that they can kind of be leveled for different users. Um, there's all sorts of ways to kind of play with it. Um, but it's not an easy answer is maybe the best way to put it. I don't know so if anybody else wants to pop in. Let's broaden that so uh, to bring Stella and Moni in, not just specifically mm -hmm. fan service, but one, one of the challenges we hear a lot is how do I know what resources can help me? You know, nobody, few people have the time to read every comic out there. I, I thought I'd be reading more comics working here. I don't have the time. So as librarians, what resource, what are some resources you'd recommend if you don't have the time or ability to read a 10 volume series, what do you use or recommend uh, to help identify the potential age appropriateness? And what are some indicators you look for beyond a publisher age rating? Start with Moni. Ah, okay. Um, I mean, I will look at like Goodreads, Amazon, uh, Mackin, I believe it's free, but they do have age ratings. Um, school library journal, library journal, book list. I'm trying to think, oh, for comics, No Flying, No Tights is an awesome one. Um, and I know I'm forgetting some, so I will yield to the next presenter. Exactly. Using the publishers that you know and starting there. Actually, if you can get your hands on the book, borrow it from another library or, you know, take a afternoon and go to the bookstore and spend some time there um, talking to other readers about what they're reading and how they would categorize a book. Um, I also would um, talk to my students because sometimes they would tell me things about the books and I'm like, oh my gosh. And I would go grab them off the shelf and take a look. So using your resources, the people that you know that are reading, um, looking at reviews such in like Amazon and Capstone and some of the, I know Follett had a, um, an area where it would give the reviews from like school library journal and places like that for you. So definitely utilizing the tools that are out there. Ashley, any uh, specific recommendations? I mean, I think they were all mentioned. Like I, Mackin has such a great, site because it pulls from all the review sites. Um, I'm I'm a little biased. I'm a book list reviewer. Um, I review about 15 manga a month um, because there's such high demand. Um, also, um, I have a site where I do reviews and lists and all sorts of things. I take requests. Um, Sarah Smith also has a site called The Graphic Library. Um, Julie Stivers has a site called Manga in the Middle, where she targets particularly middle grade, um, middle school um, age um, recommendations and does reviews um, because that is a very difficult age range to collect for. Um, and she has the expertise of having collected in that age range. Um, and yeah, 
uh, otherwise, I think everything else that I was going to recommend was mentioned. Um, th there are great resources out there. The the one I particularly like is talk to your readers. You if you're collect if you're adding comics to your collection, it's probably it's to uh, some level of demand. You know, talking to readers is a great way to learn more about a category you may not be as familiar with. Um, so let's get into collection management. We got a lot of questions about everything from how do you introduce comics into a collection to how do you keep it weeded? How do you uh, make purchasing decisions around uh, particularly long series? Um, I'm going to start with this one, though, because personally, I found this particularly interesting. Do you shelve your comics and graphic novels together? And do you shelve them together or separate, separate from related genres? And clockwise for me, we'll go Moni, Stella, Ashley. And we'll work in the genrefication question there. I, I, I want to kind of collapse those into one big question, pick it away at it as you choose. Sure, let me see if I cover all the bases. So the way that I've found the most success if you mean separate from the rest of the collection, comics, graphic no novels, manga, yes, separate from the rest of the collection. So go to the 700s Dewey and dust off those old cartoons and bring them out to get some nice signage, carve out a space, no matter how small, um, really just find a way to draw attention to it, whatever the amount of a shelf and a half is all you have. Um, I have preferred in the past to put, to not collect single issues, to do collected volumes or graphic novels as I as I defined them in the beginning um, together and then manga next to them or very close. And that's just so that you have the choice to read either or, but you also have the choice to read both should you want to. I think I covered everything that you asked. <laughs> it's a big question. It is. Uh, Stella? I agree. I um inherited a very small collection and it was just graphic novels, anything that was sequential. And I made a decision to move it into a casual area where we had a couch and expanded in that way. And I definitely kept the manga separate, not separate. It was in the same area, but in di on different shelves than the um, comic book. Because to me, they're two different readers. They, if they want manga, they're going to go to manga. If they want comics, you know, they want, they're going to go to the comics. And, but I did pull out the cartoon strips like Garfield and that kind of thing and put those there. I also put some of the um, specific manga drawing books just so that I could set up an area for drawing. And um, what was the other question? I, I know there was a question about putting them on the shelf that they take up, you know, if there's a long series that it takes up a long, a lot of space. I have seen non-traditional, but to stack them. And I've also seen, yeah, it might get messy and you might have to go back after ninth graders come in or sixth graders come in, but that's all, that's all the fun in the games, right? Um, I've also seen where, in fact, I was just in a library here in Austin last week that they had baskets just like for school librarians and your early readers and those chapter books, those early chapter books that you know are a series and we put them up on a side so that they're easy to find for those kindergarten first graders. Same thing, we they had baskets with just Superman. They had baskets with just Spider-Man. They had all the manga separated and then some of their very popular, they just put in a basket so they didn't have to worry about putting them in order or anything like that. They just had them in a basket and then they had them alphabetical by the um, creator or author. So did I get them all, I think? So I'm very big on the stickers. I had a ton of stickers. So if you wanna go into the genrefication, I was so much about putting the, the stickers on the book. I All of my sequential art had um, graphic on it and then they would have another sticker that related to either shoujo or shunian or comic books. And um, my nonfiction back in the day, I had it in that section, but hindsight, I think I would put it into my nonfiction collection with my biographies and that kind of thing. I think it's just, a, it's like you say, it's another medium. So why not have it next to the, um, the text version. So that's what I would do now. AOA has oh. a really great, sorry, uh, the graphic novel and comics roundtable has a really great 
updated best practices for like cataloging and shelving. You can check that out on ALA GNCRT's website. They're coming out with one from with manga, I believe, but it's just kind of one thing at a time right now. Ashley, shelving, cataloging, genrefication. <laughs> okay, so <clears throat> I have been at two different types of libraries. I have been at a high school library and I am now at an elementary school library. So when I was at high school, I had a massive manga section. Um, and when I was there, I did genrefy. Um, so I had very specific genre selections and I kept my manga separate. I kept my light novel separate. Um, so I kept everything kind of insular. Now um, at the elementary school, um, I'm having some difficulties sourcing because of Eric Adams um, not giving money. Um, so I don't have the funding to get it um, as much as I would like. Um, so I have to kind of piecemeal it and find it as I can. Also, it's just hard. Some titles that I really want are out of print. Um, like I really, really need fluffy, fluffy cinema roll. It's out of print. It costs $250 to get a copy of it. Um, but I do have a shelf that is dedicated just to manga. Um, and then it's right next to my graphic novels, um, which honestly, my graphic novel section is still small um we we just uh the my predecessor um did not believe in any graphic formats so i am starting from zero with very little budget so i'm eking it out very slowly um so but i do believe in making it accessible to the readers who want it um, with nonfiction, though, I do just integrate it into the nonfiction sections because, um, especially with elementary readers, they just are going for the sharks. If it's a graphic novel that's about sharks, if it's a nonfiction book that's about sharks, it doesn't matter. It's about sharks. They're at <laughs> it. Um, but um, even though I've got a genre-fied library, my graphics readers, um, they'll just tear apart my shelves looking for the graphics if I don't have them in their own section. Um, they're a little rabid right now. Um, and may, maybe I will reintegrate into the subjects when we have a bigger collection, so. Gee, I so wanted to kind of touch on the the collection development of, you know, do you buy a few a few volumes or do you buy the whole volume, you know, the whole set? Oh, perfect. Um, That's I what think I was we about to missed... see up next. No, no, that <laughs> was actually, I was putting that up. That and the the other half of that is when is it time to get rid okay. of a series? You know, something that's past its prime. So let's cover both of those. Okay. Um, I'll go ahead and start it since I've got my microphone off. <laughs> um <laughs> I used to basically because of budget, I would buy the first three just because I figured one, you know, it's probably hit or miss Two, Okay. If it's good, then they're going to want the third one. And then I can make a decision at that point um, and then go, you know, a couple more. And again, talking to my readers, you know, which one, I mean, I used to walk in the backside of the cafeteria with my stack that I went to Barnes and Noble or um, whichever bookstore, uh, in uh, in town or closest to where I was that night <clears throat> and they would follow me to, to the library so that they could check it out um talking about the deselection of the comics and graphic novels you're going to use your same collection policy and your deselection policy in making those decisions the only thing is I would definitely talk to your readers again and then also take a look and see what's coming out on anime is there something that's popping up like One Piece? One Piece is really old. And, you know, I just finished watching, my husband and I just finished watching One Piece, the whole um, series, and I can't wait to go and read it because I have never read it. And I'm sure this is popping back up. I know Astro Boy, I don't know how many times I was like, ah, no one's really reading this, I'm gonna take it. But then I decided, oh, you know what? I'm gonna put, I'm gonna do a book talk on it and, again, it would come back up and they would start reading it. So just kind of keep that in mind. There's a couple of different resources that you can go and look just like movies when they're coming out and what's, you know, going away and that kind of thing. 
Melanie? Just like any collection, it kind of should be based on if you can get to it quarterly, you know, performance, checkouts, how many people are actually interested. Um, when I started the adult graphic novel section or comic section at the library I was at at the time, um, I had, I think, like $200 to, to start with. And so that was pulling those out of, you know, the cartoon section, pulling what was too mature for the teen section out of teen and making it into its own in the adult area. Um, and then trial and error, looking at, as Stella said, like what's popular right now in, in film and popular culture, what people might be interested in, and then anything like region specific. And then just kind of as many, I, I did as many just volume one, I used to kind of make them big. So especially with that limited of a budget and then just checking in that at, the, at first checking in really weekly to kind of see like, I have nothing on the shelves. I know this collection is successful, but what are people actually reading from the collection? And so once you kind of get staff to start jotting down, you know, what people are asking for, uh, once you start seeing what's circulating, once you're seeing what's popular in the retail sites, then you can make better decisions. And then also like Ashley mentioned, things go out of print, um, balancing with digital access. You know, even before I worked at Comics Plus, I was big on meet your readers where they are, you know, finish collections whenever you can. And so balancing in, in the digital format is always an option available, especially if you run out of shelf space or budget. Ashley? Um, yeah, uh, something else you can do is um, Shonen Jump um, ha is a simul pub. Um, also, you can also use Ma Manga Plus um, is also a simul pub where you can see what is rising in popularity. Um, Manga Plus in particular will tell you what is most popular. So when Oshinoko was really starting to get popular before it was picked up for publication, um, sorry um that would that gave an indication like this is really popular oh there's an anime coming oh it's gonna get licensed any day now and it was um so you can kind of keep track that way uh there are awards in japan for manga um that will kind of let you know what's coming down the pike there are always rumors about what is getting an anime soon and if it's not in publication yet then you know that it's going to get a license fairly soon um shonen jump works generally are going to get a license very quick um they get simulpubbed here meaning that they are simultaneously published here and in japan um because quite honestly they are the most pirated um text so they are they would rather not be pirated um so to keep it legal keep things you know good um so honestly if it's running in shonen jump it's gonna get printed it's gonna be popular it's gonna get an anime um shogakukan and shueisha have a lot of pull with getting anime made um it's always worth it to check out what's going on there you can also preview um even if you're not paying for shonen jump you can see the first chapter actually i think it's the first three chapters and the most recent three chapters um in english it, this is not in japanese this is in english uh or you can pay i think they raised it up to two dollars and 99 cents recently i don't even know i'm paying for it and i don't even know um but you can you can pay just a few dollars to have a huge, just being able to look through it and know what's going on um, was like a really huge help for me, especially as somebody who doesn't read Shonen as a rule, um, just being able to like flip through and like go, okay, uh, there's a recent series, Dan Da Dan. I knew that that was not the best fit for my high school library, even though it's a Shonen Jump title because it's just a little bit too edgy. Um, so I'm like, okay, that's better for an adult collection. Um, and it just took to like, just looking through it, just kind of reading. So there are different ways to kind of know what's going to be popular just by paying attention. Uh, have any of you, this came up uh, in the Q&A, have any of you dealt uh, across the aisle, so to speak, uh, school working with a public library to kind of balance collection needs or vice versa? 
public library giving schools insights about what's circulating. I know some public libraries offer direct access to schools through student IDs. Any specific examples from one side to the other to kind of optimize that relationship? Not necessarily, but they did get the, the <laughs> comics that I decided were on that edgy and that 16, but maybe 18. So they got donations. <laughs> okay. All right, uh, let's see. So we are coming up towards the end. So I wanna shift us to kind of the reader's advisory side of things. We've got, as always, a ton of very specific requests that we're not gonna be able to get into. Um, but a couple of things that come up a lot. The never ending, how do you convince, insert the person who hates comics, that comics are legitimate reading, that it's okay for kids or adults to read comics, and that there's no need to apologize for the existence of comics. I'll wrap that question up that way. How do you talk to people who don't believe comics are legitimate reading, belong in libraries. How do you tackle that? Uh, I have a few resources and I noticed that we all kind of touched on them in our document, but um, there are a number of organizations dedicated to this and just looking to it, like academics, college level, there's grants for comics, there's all kinds of things going on. Um, but, you know, uh, I, full disclosure, co-founded, but I do have some talking points from uh, Creators Assemble, with, which is the nonprofit that I co-founded, that does talk specifically about, because in the case that I mentioned where I had to justify and get a $200 budget, speaking to admin about why we needed this collection, and then spanning out from there and speaking to like parents, why am I paying for a college class when you're using comics in the classroom? And so um, being able to talk about that there are different forms of literacy, and the visual art uh, portion of comics is a different form of literacy than traditional. Uh, there's all kinds of studies now out there. There's so many study guides and ways that uh, educators are utilizing comics, graphic novels, manga as uh, supplementals. And we actually did a study at Creators Assemble where we found that students overall overwhelmingly found the subjects that they were learning about, in that case, it was World War II, uh, easier to understand or contextualize once they had read a few graphic novels on the subject as well. So, I mean, everything from citing circulation statistics, you know, that collection that I managed ended up being the third highest circulating collection in the entire library behind like kids books and movies, which is huge, um, to, you know, looking at even just retail sales. You have to meet readers where they are they're reading comics and we get we get those you know retail sales reports all the time. So those are just a few. I'll, I'll leave the rest to my colleagues. I generally would choose a book if it's like a teacher that I want to convince. I would pull out some of the manga classics. I would pull out other beautiful books that share a story that um is told so beautiful, you know, that is so raw of a story. This is about the nuclear plant that um, it, that um, went awry after the tsunami. And just, it's so raw of a topic that this is a good way to do it with the images that kind of create the thought process that they're gonna need to digest such a, a difficult topic. So that's one way, again, using the classics the, you know, Romeo and Juliet, Juliet or Macbeth. Um, there are some great ones that we're starting to find in our collection in Comics Plus on poetry that I'm super excited about to be able to share. Um, but, you know, finding that book that you love, again, it, you know, it's kind of going back to that reader when you try to do a book talk, it's you're sharing your love of it or your understanding of it. Maybe it's not your favorite you know, medium to read in, but you understand how excited kids are about it or your other patrons are about it, that you share their stories, you share um, their understanding and their how they've learned and grown through reading a comic book or a manga. Ashley? Hey, so um, I often share just my experiences with students and so there are so many times where 
manga was or graphic novels or comics or anything were often a very affirming um experience for students so for example i had a student who um he is a trans boy and they read um boys from the riot and they came back to me the next day after having read that book and said there has never been a book that got me as much as this book got me and i you know it just those type of moments um are really important and super valid and it's like i had handed this student prose books before but that connection had not happened before um i had a student make a really deep um observation about chainsaw man um about how the characters like the characterization of denji um was actually like a front to make up for his childhood traumas um there can be really deep reading that happens with manga and um i just kind of gather the proof uh redact the names and also um I don't know if you know any other readers besides readers who read in graphic formats who can pack in 5, 10, 15, 20 books a day. Um, like that is pretty compelling evidence in and of itself. Um, and then, you know, you bring in the studies that show that actually graphic formats tend to have higher vocabulary because word choice has to be very deliberate. Then we have to tap into the fact that these are multimodal texts and we have students that need to function in a highly visual world. And um, you, you start to unpack that maybe we need to cool it a little bit. And then also, you know, offer texts that are more along the lines of what people consider, you know, high art, but also like, it doesn't need to be high art to be considered legitimate. Like I had some pretty, like Chainsaw Man is not considered high art. Um, although there's arguments about whether or not um, art is subjective, it's art. Um, but, you know, I do offer like, listen, there was this recent edition of this book called Okinawa. Um, an incredibly in-depth examination of something that isn't even really talked about in Japan, which is the occupation of Okinawa and um, the Battle of Okinawa. Um, there are really complex in-depth texts. Um, there have been some really great graphic um, contemplations of the Fukushima Daiichi uh, disaster. So you just got to kind of explore um beyond just what your stereotype of what the formats are all right so we are technically at the end but i'm going to squeeze in two final ones so that we can kind of cover the breadth if not the depth of everything we set out for uh so real quick uh, each of you, one compelling programming idea related to comics and manga that you'd either have done successfully or that you've seen and would recommend. And we'll go reverse order this time. So Ashley, Stella, Moni. Um, one of my favorite things to do is anime or manga journaling, um, which is a whole thing in and of itself you can search it on youtube you will find various creators that do it um i myself am just a i really like stationery i really like journaling um and it actually has been really great for students to like contemplate the texts that they interact with the most including not just manga but also like when we would have anime club we would kind of journal a little bit about what we watched and like how it made us feel so Stella? I um, did a couple things. One, we had a Pokemon tournament 
which was super popular. And then also I was able to, after I came back from Japan, I um, talked to my, some of my art teachers into coming and doing calligraphy lessons. And we also did a particular style of Japanese painting. So I tried to bring a little bit of the culture. We had sushi one day with my, my book club, just so that they could see what we were talking about and what it looked like, the things that they were reading about. Cool. So uh, I actually have kind of a cool, like, I don't want to say formula because it makes it sound like it's so, but it really worked well. And that is we we actually, um, for the library that I was working at, I won a California uh, State PR Excellence Award for this uh, this particular program. And that was because I identified an underserved population that we wanted to see more of in the library. So in this case, it was the dads or the male caregivers in families who didn't really feel like they had a lot going on in the library. Uh, free comic book day, the Star Wars day, because it landed on May the 4th, and free food. So it was called Dads and Donuts, but it was for the male caregiver of the family to bring the family uh, to the library. But in, in that case, combine like we had comics sorted in age appropriate uh, areas so that they could take the free ones from from the comic book shop and you know did a little plug for the local shop uh, but then once they did that they got free donuts and then they got to go around and the kids kind of went and did some coloring and met with the cosplayers but the dads got to meet other dads and talk with one another. And then we showcased like our virtual reality when that was a new technology. Uh, we showcased our 3D printer. So we were making like Star Wars related um, items and raffling them off. But essentially it was a great way to just really pull in several different things. We're doing a variation on that for kids. We're gonna be teaching about marginalized artists um, this summer. And so we're gonna be using like uh, free comics to come in and then the kids are going to get fed, but then they're going to get to use like Oculus to learn about the time and place that the artist they're, they're learning about, read a graphic novel about the artist and then do their own like artwork inspired by that art, that artist's work. So just, you know, thinking of who you want to target, add plus comics or manga, plus, you know, the things you want to highlight at your library and just, it makes magic. Nice. All right, so we're going to close with uh, recommendations. We're going to do our own little reader's advisory, and to keep it kind of uh, simple, I'm going to ask each of you for just, uh, I think Stella alluded to this, a book you just love, a comic or manga you love, and pick one for younger readers, however you choose to define that, and one for older readers. And so we'll close out uh, Moni, Stella, Ashley. All right. Uh, I read a ton of comics, as you can imagine. Not Anything? Bad. Oh, it's all good. Anything by Espy, who is a European um, graphic artist. So we have The Parakeet at Comics Plus. It's a wonderful book. And then The Past was another one that he wrote. And then for kids, I guess for teens, kind of, one of my favorites that sticks out at the moment anyway is Chef's Kiss. It's an Oni press book and it's super, ah, it's super, super cute. <laughs> yes. Leave it to Stella. Cool. All right, Stella. Uh, did she take one of yours? <laughs> yes, she did. She, this is <laughs> what I'm currently reading. I um, love these and I love anything on cooking. I'm a pastry chef, so I love anything on baking and cooking. And there's a series, I wish I could find it, but there's another series that is Japanese and um, that talks about the their their food and it was like one of the stories I remember was a tea and why do you drink hot tea in the summer and it's and it has this whole explanation about it but anyway so anything along the food line and I am reading one piece right now just so that I can compare it and I can tell already I haven't even opened read it yet but I can tell that it has some new things to it that even though I've seen the anime hey there's gonna be new a new experience so Ashley you okay, already gave us so, cats, so no cat manga. <laughs> oh, you can't you can't say that. No, because you, you quite can. honestly, the best kid manga is honestly cat manga. Um uh Pandania um is a creator who creates incredible cat manga um that kids uh fight over. Um, literally, um, I once had to separate two kids off of yokai cats. Um, but they have 
um, a new series that's coming out in May. Um, so it's something to pick up in your 2024 orders, uh, fall 2024 orders, Monster Cats. Um, so uh, I was super excited that this one's finally coming over. So it's, um, you know, cats that are kind of crossed with um, supernatural beings like banshees and yetis and gorgons and <laughs> things like that. And they're just getting up to little hijinks. Um, and any of those are really awesome. But um, for adults, um, there is a single volume manga, which is one that I didn't bring over, but it's behind me. Um, it is Talk to My Back. Um, by Yamada Murasaki. Um, and it is actually um, an alt manga. Um, and it's just an exploration of what did it mean to be a woman in Japan's suburban middle class during the 1980s. Um, and it is really contemplative and beautiful. And um, I highly recommend it. Single volume, it's a great mm -hmm. sort of if you're somebody who um, wants manga that doesn't objectify women, this is the opposite of manga that objectifies women. This is an exploration of women's identity. Um, so I highly recommend it. Cool. So I'm going to drop my two. Um, so this on the manga side for young readers, which had Atelier is, I think this is bridges that younger to adult. I'm reading it. Obviously, I'm not a younger reader. I think it's an amazing fantasy story um, that is pretty much appropriate for at least seven volumes in. I don't know, Ashley, does it get crazy as it goes further, but seven volumes in, appropriate for pretty much anybody that can handle reading that level of text. And then Do a Power Bomb was the most amazing, ridiculous thing I read last year about wrestling. It's, you know, I, I think we'd call it manga influenced from an art perspective, but whether you like wrestling or not, um, I think you would find it and it really entertaining, definitely for older readers. Um, so thank you guys so much. Thank you for all of our attendees. Thank you for those who stayed a few minutes longer. We will post um, with the archive. We are going to consolidate as many of the questions we got ahead of time and that we got here and put together an FAQ that uh, includes links to the resources. I know it was hard for everybody to stay on top of everything we threw out there at you. And it's really hard to stay on top of the Q&A section and find links while we're talking. So we are going to consolidate uh, as much of this as possible and post it alongside the archive. We will have links to a variety of resources, recommendations, as much as we can pull together from the questions that came in. Um, and to one question, I think we will do this again. This is clearly an evergreen topic. Uh, so maybe we'll do it twice a year and we'll come back and you know maybe we'll do 102 next time instead of 101. So thank you Moni, Stella, and Ashley for taking the time, sharing your expertise. Thank you uh, attendees uh, for signing up and joining us. If you want to learn more about Comics Plus, comicspluss.app.com. And again, look for the email with a link to the archive and have a great rest of your day. Take care. <laughs>